My antifood paper is titled Storm Drains as Assemblages, the Political Ecology of Flood Risk in Postcolonial Bangalore. I wrote this paper because I wanted to tell the story of why this city of some 8 million people seems to flood more and more readily every monsoon season. Bangalore isn't near a coast. In fact, it sits some 3,000 feet high on the Deccan Plateau, far from India's two southern coastlines. It has no major river of its own. The Kaveri River, which meets some of the city's water demand, is pumped from 100 kilometers away. So then, why the flooding? As I began looking into the question and studying recent flood events, I was dissatisfied with mainstream explanations. Failing infrastructure, inept government, runaway population growth, etc. These explanations were apolitical. They obscured a longer spatial history of the city and tended to black box the causal drivers underlying flood risk. I also found critical scholarly explanations of flood risk in the global south more generally limited in that while they considered how power and politics alter natural systems, often to the detriment of the poor, they tended to discount the gritty reality and active capacities of urban natures. That is, the peculiar material qualities that enable stormwater, wetlands, and drains to inde indelibly shape social processes. In this paper, I argue that to understand heightened flood risk in Bangalore today, we have to unveil our complex relationships with stormwater drains. When we think of storm drains, what in Kannada are called Rajakalaves, we think of mundane pipes that carry away runoff. But storm drains are much more than a singular piped technology. They comprise an assemblage of old irrigation canals and wetlands, rain and concrete, waste and buildings, flows and fixities. This paper traces how this assembling came to be, from the city's agrarian past to its millennial present. It shows how the colonial obsession with modernization and hygiene forever changed storm drains in the wetlands they traversed. It shows how in the post-independence era, state-led development and malaria eradication further devalued wetlands and why. And finally, it shows how today, in the absence of an equitable housing policy, real estate capital has been leveraged by opaque extra-legal channels to transform storm canals and wetlands into informal real estate. Low-end encroachers, so-called, are often unjustly blamed for flooding in this process. All of these shifts have had dire consequences for flood risk and vulnerability. Overall, this case teaches us that flooding is not simply the inevitable outcome of nature, nor is it due to faceless social forces wreaking havoc. Rather, it is a result of social and natural processes transforming each other, often in unexpected, complicated ways. I'd like to think of my study as part of a growing body of empirically grounded and historically sensitive research on the political ecology of risk in postcolonial cities. So where does this take us? Well, we've seen a lot of hype over climate change adaptation in recent years. To this global conversation, we need to bring a creative sense of two things. First, the range of social, political, economic, cultural, and ecological drivers that have historically created flood risk in particular places. Even if this kind of analysis challenges the status quo and brings to light new culprits. And second, how to change the problematic relations between humans and urban ecologies that we've inherited. This is a vision for more wholesale systemic change, not simply the building of higher dams or larger pipes or the penalization of the vulnerable, but it is a vision that is more likely to bring about the kind of longer term safety and genuine resilience that we need in the context of ever more uncertainty in the urban environment.